Thanks, all of you, for being here. I think I'll direct this to Dr. Fauci, but I welcome everybody's answer. I just want to go through so what we do know. We've heard a lot about what we don't know. So here are the things that we do know, okay? Um, so SARS-1, we identified the host animal within four months. MERS, I believe we identified the host animal within nine months. It's now been 15 and a half, 16 months. We've still not seen, and China's not produced any evidence of uh, the host uh, animal that transmitted COVID-19 from for, to a human. Um, we know that China has a history of, of lab accidents. I think, Dr. Fauci, you answered Senator Graham's question. I think he phrased it as, has there ever been a pandemic that came out of a laboratory? And the answer was no. But we do know of outbreaks that came out of a, out of a laboratory. I believe uh, back in 2004, uh, two researchers in Beijing uh, were infected doing research on SARS and, and led to an outbreak. Uh, China has a, a history of lab accidents. Um, this outbreak happened in a city that happened to be the home, coincidentally, of a lab, which we know is involved in extensive research. And what they do is they take this naturally occurring virus and they manipulate it and they change it to make it infectious to humans. We know that they do that there. They've published about it. And it also happened in a city, in, in a lab, where a Rutgers biosecurity expert raised concerns about uh, its safety. And, and our diplomats in 2018 were cabling back to Washington expressing concern about the safety. So I take all those facts together, right? SARS, we knew the host in four months. MERS, we knew the host in nine. We still don't know the, the, the host in, for COVID, even though, and China's not being transparent about it, even though they have a vested interest in producing the host so they can put all those down. Um, in a lab that we know is involved in m changing viruses synthetically so that they become infectious for humans, um, in a lab that diplomats have told us is unsafe, in a country that had a history of lab leaks, and by the way, in a virus that we know can be synthetically created because the Swiss did it. The Swiss created an exact replica of this virus in the lab uh, for purposes of answering it. All these facts were available to us last May, last April. Why, I'll start with Dr. Fanny. Why, why did you dismiss the lab leak theory as, as credible? I have always said that the high likelihood is that this is a natural occurrence. I didn't dismiss anything. I just said it's a high likelihood that this is a natural occurrence from the environment of an animal reservoir that we have not yet identified. Well, and I still maintain that. But as, as I just mentioned to the response to other questions, that since you don't know 100 percent about that, because no one knows, including me, 100 percent, what the origin is, is the reason why we're in favor of further investigation. Well, given everything I've decided, and if, I, if anything I decided is incorrect, uh, I hope it will be correct that I'm relying, obviously it's not my field of study, so I'm relying on but what other experts in, have published. What is the basis for this li high likely, what is the basis for the conclusion that it is likelier to have been naturally occurring than a lab accident? I asked a specific question to the Director of National Intelligence, and how I posed it is, is it not true that it is the assessment that they are equally likely based on our information that we have. So as I outline all of these things here, is she wrong when she answered me yes? And based on everything I've just cited, why the, what is it that we're basing the higher likelihood of naturally occurring? Is it simply because that's all we've ever seen in the past? Well, we have historical experience that happened with SARS, COVID-1. It happened with MERS. It happened with HIV. It happened with virtually all the influenza pandemics. So the historical basis for pandemics evolving naturally from an animal reservoir is extremely strong. And it's for that reason that we felt that something similar like this has a much higher likelihood. But again, getting back to what I said, and let me repeat so there's no lack of clarity in that, no one knows, not even I, 100% percent at this point, which is the reason why we are in favor of further investigation. But going back to precedent, the, the precedents require them to be similar. The difference between this one and that one is, in, as I said, four months we knew the host for SARS, and nine months we knew the host for MERS. China has all the 
incentive in the world to produce this host and hasn't done so, and then you add up all these other things. I mean, is it just a coincidence that happened in the city that's doing this kind of research, which, by the way, is controversial? I know you and others have been supportive of it, but, but it's controversial. It's not widely accepted as, as, as good. My whole point is there are people out there who had Facebook posts taken down, they're called kooks, conspiracy theorists, for saying publicly a year ago what we now say may be possible. And I think those people deserve an apology at a minimum. Thank you. Let me ask you a couple more. Did you enjoy listening in Mississippi? I'm sorry? Did you enjoy living in Mississippi? Yes, I did. Yeah, good. Um, you talked about the poverty in Mississippi. Where do, you, where do you live now? I live in Menlo Park, California. Okay. Is there poverty in Menlo Park? There are, po there are yes, there are parts of, yes. Yeah. That's correct. Is it, is it uh, uh, deep poverty? I, I couldn't give you a That's okay. exact answer just, to just, that question. I just want to make sure California, I'm not happy about either circumstance, but you, you zeroed in on Mississippi, and I just wanted to uh, make sure you weren't picking on Mississippi. Oh, no, I was just asked about it. Chairman Durbin specifically asked me to talk about Mississippi. Right. That's oh, the did? only reason why I came up. Okay. Yes. All right. I originally didn't mention it in my family story. I'm just curious. What, do you know the name of the person who cleans your office? Yes, uh, Steve is the one who takes out the garbage every day. He comes by at 3 o'clock, and Eva is the one who cleans in the morning about Good 7 a.m. Good for you. Yes. Good for you. Um, look, I'm not real big on, on holding people too accountable for, for, for crazy things they said when they were young. Because uh, I've said a few myself. I've even done a few things. <laughs> But, but i got to read you this from an article you wrote in, uh, when you were at Harvard Law. I'm going to quote. That's okay. I'm not going to try to paraphrase. Here's what you wrote. Minority judges still need to maintain the disguise of objectivity or face challenges to their decisions. Yes, a minority judge is going to identify with a minority party's experiences. experiences. But she can't admit this. We've got to get more clever and say, look, we're just as neutral as any 60-year-old white man. Do you still believe that? Not at all. I agree. I disagree with that 100%. It is something I said 31 years ago, my 1L fall semester uh, year, fall of 1990, and that is completely wrong. Our rule of law absolutely depends on impartiality, fairness, and I completely disagree with that statement. Yeah. Could, could I just ask, did you make that statement based on, well, why did you make that statement? What were you thinking then? I was having a conversation with three 1L classmates in a room, um, and I think that statement shows a lack of maturity, yeah. shows a lack of experience in the world, shows a lack of knowledge about the law, um, and I completely disagree with it. Okay, fair enough. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Thank you very much, Mr. The gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At a memorial event for David Hamburg, Speaker Pelosi and I had a chance to discuss impeachment. Mr. Dean, who wrote that? I did. 19, uh, excuse me, one month ago, May 11th, 2019. Haven't we been too long in not giving Trump a meaningful moniker? Should it be deranged on, deadbeat on, demagogue on? Thoughts, please, comments. Mr. Dean, who wrote that? I assume that was mine. It was yours. 19 days ago, May 22nd, 2019, there was this. We are witnessing Trump's massive cover-up of his criminal behavior as POTUS. He's incapable of accomplishing anything. Mr. Dean, you know who wrote that? I suspect that was me again. It was you. I want to focus on that last sentence. As POTUS, as President of the United States, he, Donald Trump, is incapable of accomplishing anything. When you made that statement, Mr. Dean, what did you have in mind? You thinking about the 3.2% economic growth rate, uh, rate we had the last quarter? 
thinking about the fact we got the lowest unemployment in 50 years? How about the fact the hostages are back from North Korea? Maybe you were thinking about this. When you said the President of the United States was incapable of doing anything, were you thinking about the fact that the embassy is now in Jerusalem? I mean, I think about this one. Every single candidate for as many cycles as I can remember, Republican and Democrat, have promised the American people, you elect me, we're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And guess what? They get elected and they come up with a million reasons why they can't do what they said they were going to do. But this president didn't. The embassy is now in Jerusalem. So I'm just wondering, what were you thinking about when you said he's incapable of accomplishing anything? Uh, Mr. Jordan, I think that uh, under the parliamentary rules of the House, uh, I'm refrained from addressing a full answer to your question. You, you, weren't, you, weren't refrained, uh, you weren't refrained in your tweets and your comments and the things my you tweet, wrote. My tweets are not subject to the parliamentary. They are subject to state of mind and the perspective you bring to this hearing. And I think the American people understand. Let me ask you this then. Did you give advice to Lanny Davis or Michael Cohen prior to Mr. Cohen's testimony to Congress? No. Well, you said on Aaron Burnett's uh, show the night before Mr. Cohen testified in front of the Oversight Committee that Michael Cohen should, you said you had talked to Lanny Davis and that Michael Cohen should hold his testimony as long as possible from Republicans. You didn't say that to Mr. Davis? You said no. it on, on Aaron Burnett's show the night before well, Mr. I Cohen testified. I didn't say it. Uh, directly to Mr. Cohen was your question. No, it wasn't. My question was, did you give advice to Lanny Davis or Michael Cohen had, prior I've, to Mr. Cohen's testimony to Congress? Yeah, I have known Lanny Davis for almost a couple decades, uh, and we have talked about it. And I did say, uh, as soon as you turn your testimony over, it will be picked apart. So you instructed Michael Cohen's lawyer to keep information from Republicans to obstruct the committee work that we were doing in the Oversight Committee just a few months ago? You, you told that to M Michael Cohen's lawyer? Uh, I didn't quite phrase it that well, way, no. You know what? They took your advice. I'm sorry? They took your advice. Did they? Yeah. I Mr. Didn't Mr. Know Cohen that. kept his testimony from us for as long as possible. But you know what else Mr. Cohen did that day? Lied. Lied seven times. And this is, this is what I think concerns so many Americans. This is what concerns, I think, so many Americans about the work that's going on in this Congress, this 116. The first, the first announced witness of the 116th Congress was Michael Cohen, a guy who sits in prison today for lying to Congress. Today, Chairman Nadler brings in front of the Judiciary Committee a guy to talk about obstruction of justice who went to prison in 1974 for obstructing justice. I did not go to prison. Okay. You pled guilty to obstruction of justice. I'm glad you got to stay out of prison then, I guess. What bothers me the most, though, is this committee's failure to investigate how the whole Trump-Russia thing started. This is the Judiciary Committee. We're supposed to, how this whole thing began. And I, I said this a few weeks ago, but I want to remind this committee what the Attorney General of the United States said eight weeks ago when he testified in front of the Senate. He said four important things about the beginnings of the Trump-Russia investigation. He said there was a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI. His words, not mine, upper echelon. That's certainly true. Comey, McKay, Baker, Strzok, Page, they've all been fired, demoted, let go, they're gone. Some of them are under investigation by the Justice Department. He said spying did occur, he said it twice. He said there's a basis for his concern about the spying that took place. And he used two terms that, again, I think this committee should find frightening and should be looking into. Unauthorized surveillance and political surveillance. Scary terms. So the good news is, even though this Congress has memorandums of understanding between the key committee chairman on how they're going to coordinate their attack on the president, even though this Congress, first big witness, first big hearing, Michael Cohen, a guy who sits in prison for lying to Congress, and even though we now have a guy testifying about obstruction of justice who pled guilty to obstruction of justice, we should be looking into the things Bill Barr's looking at. Now, the good news is Mr. Durham's doing that. But th this, is, this is the part, I think, that frustrates so many. Mr. Chairman, I would hope the Judiciary Committee and the history this committee has for protecting fundamental liberties would begin to look into those key issues, the whole premise for how this Trump-Russia investigation started in the first place. And I'll, I'll finish again with this. Emmett Flood wrote a letter to the Attorney General a few weeks back, made an important point. He said, we would all do well to remember if they can do it to a president, imagine what they can do to you and me. Imagine what they can do to regular citizens across this great country. That should be what this committee most safeguards and most protects. And instead, 
We got memorandums of understanding between the chairman. We got Michael Cohen testifying for seven hours, getting advice from the witness here on obstructing the committee work and not sharing the information with us in a timely fashion. And now we got John Dean, 45 years ago, went to pled guilty to obstruction of justice and now coming in to enlighten the Judiciary Committee on Obstruction of Justice when we could be going right to the start of how this whole thing started. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Before I go to, Ms., uh, to the next witness, I want to point out that this committee has no memorandum of understanding with any other committee with reference to the, any investigations. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, excuse, this committee has no such memorandum of understanding. And I'm not aware of any others, but there may be. But this committee has no such memorandum of understanding. And number two, since the gentleman from Ohio cast dispersions on the, on the witness, I would remind everyone that uh, after the after Mr. No, I didn't, Mr. Chairman. I read his statements. I'm I did not cast dispersions. I read his statements. Very well. Since I believe the gentleman cast dispersions. You're wrong. Fine. Since I believe the gentleman cast dispersions on the character and truthfulness of the witness, I would remind everyone that after exhaustive testimony in 1973, when the tapes were revealed, it was revealed that everything that, that Mr. Dean said was correct and truthful. The, the next witness... Mr. Next Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Uh, 